Um, this is uh, the first lecture within uh, this year's series uh, in 2021. And I wish you all a uh, safe, healthy, and caring uh, 2021. For all of us, 2020 was a very difficult year, and but also stand as a great reminder, as Dwayne Donald says, to remember and to practice other ways of being human being. And importance of education and gesture of unlearning colonialism is something that I, I personally learned throughout the whole year. Um, today is a Orthodox Christmas that I celebrate with my family. So for any of you who are acknowledging this date and this way of calculating time, um, wish you a peaceful year and Merry Christmas. Uh, and as I am in Melbourne, uh, I would like to also acknowledge traditional custodians of the land where I am in uh, Glen Iris, uh, Bunwurung and Wurundjeri people, traditional custodians of the land, and pay my respects to their past, present, um, and uh, emerging. Just to um, acknowledge uh, their way of understanding time and something that I find found extremely uh, inspiring. Uh, we are in the early summer here and it's a season of um, butterflies. And um, we have here uh, seven seasons uh, all together. A season of summer and end of uh, January. Um, tonight with us, we have a mentor of one of our mentors of this year's program, uh, Lisa Rosendach, uh, who is currently based in Berlin and under lockdown. Uh, she is uh, Associated Professor of Exhibition Studies at also National Academy of the Arts. In 2018, she was uh, appointed curator of 2019 and 2021 edition of GIPCA, the Gothenburg International Biennial for Contemporary Art. So the last edition is coming uh, very soon. For the last few years, her curatorial practice has been engaged in a long-term project, researching industrial modernity in Scandinavia, resulting in exhibitions such as Extracts from the Future History, Public Art Agency, Sweden, 2017, the Society Machine Malmö Kunstmuseum 2016-2017 and the Rivers of Emotions Body of Or Trondenheim Kunsthalle in 2018. Previous positions include curator at Public Art Agency Sweden between 2014-2017. Um, she was director of YASPIS when I met her, the Swedish Arts Grand Committee International Program for Visual Arts, Architecture, Design and Craft between 2011 and 2013. And before that, she was director of Baltic Art Center in uh, Visby. Uh, today's um, lecture uh, with a, a very important title, Where is Body of the Curator? Um, reflects refers to her ongoing inquiry into the question of curatorial agency and how to understand subjective and embodied acts of narration beyond the frame of individual authorship and uh, she will uh, in detail discuss two projects um, the upcoming uh, biennial uh, gipka the ghost ship and the sea change uh, that will open in mid-2021 and access from the future history from uh, 2017. So thank you, uh, Lisa, for being part of the uh, program. And uh, I would like to also thank uh, Swedish Embassy in Belgrade for uh, supporting um, uh, program and making possible that uh, Lisa is one of our mentors uh, this year. This uh, lecture is co-streamed together with the Seek Out, uh, our media partner in Southeast Europe, 
uh, as well with the, as well together with Swedish embassy um, in Belgrade. And um, I would also like to thank to all my colleagues in Belgrade who are currently in the lockdown who are really doing a great job uh, in relation to project. Um, from CICAD, but also to um, Monica Husser and Tamara Markic who are doing a PR of the project, as well as um, Aykerim Kapar, uh, that is part of what should curate and do uh, family. Um, in terms of the housekeeping, um, Lisa will be speaking for uh, around 45 minutes and then um, we will open for um, the questions. And because there is a really um, great attendance of this lecture, uh, it would be just really great um, to know where are you coming from. Um, so if you don't mind, you can uh, just please put in chat uh, just to kind of understand uh, uh, your where are you situated? Um, so, Lisa, thank you very much for joining, and um, I hand it to you. Thank you, uh, Biliana, for the invitation and for the introduction. As you mentioned, I am in Berlin, and we are in <clears throat> lockdown since a few weeks, um, and we are also in the middle of winter. It's very dark and quite depressing, <laughs> to be honest, there's no butterflies here. Uh, anyway, I am uh, lucky to uh, have a sound studio in the building where we are, so this is where I'm sitting, but um, I, would, I hope that we will not be interrupted by any children or uh, cats or other forces of nature here. Uh, and if we do, then I ask for your... Um, apology in advance. <clears throat> uh, so as this lecture is given within the context of a curatorial platform, I will use the opportunity to reflect mainly about my own uh, working process rather than the many amazing artists and artworks that I have been in dialogue with as part of that. Uh, so today's talk is called Where is the body of the curator? I'm not putting this question forward because I have the answer to it. On the contrary, its function in relation to my talk is rather to point at an issue that has made itself felt in my practice for some time and that I'm only just beginning to unravel. Western culture is full of seemingly disembodied perspectives. Running like an invisible thread through science, religion, art and bureaucracy, this God trick, as Donna Haraway calls it in her text, Situated Knowledges, grants power, and I quote Haraway, to see and not be seen, to represent while escaping representation. All too often, the role of the curator is framed in a similar position. I don't find this too comfortable. To escape representation can of course make you seem more powerful than you actually are, but it can also render you, your reasons for doing what you do, the possibilities and the limitations that shape your work, painfully invisible. Furthermore, I experience curating as a deeply embodied subjective and situated practice. So where exactly is the body of the curator? How does it make itself felt through curatorial methods and results? Curators taking an explicitly subjective approach in their work are often accused of exerting a form of authorship that risks overshadowing the work of the artists. When I started out as a young curator, some 20 years ago by now, many of the star curators of that time were discussed in those terms. <clears throat> but I think it's a mistake to think of curatorial work along the lines of the conventions of individual authorship and ownership. 
it limits our understanding of the potential of the curatorial. Curatorial practice is relational and contingent at root. A curator is never autonomous in the sense of an autonomous artist producing an artwork alone in the studio. On the contrary, a curator always produces with others in one form or another. This relationality seems to me to correspond to an understanding of the world as made up of relations and interdependencies, something that the ideological construction of individual authorship, with all its divisions of power, labor, and agency, underpinned by modernist ideas of autonomy and authenticity, tends to make invisible. But my rejection of the idea of individual authorship and ownership does not mean that I reject the possibility of voice or agency. I rather think we should use the relational nature of curatorial practice to explore polyvocal ways of telling about the world, conceived from the point of view of an agency that includes us but does not belong to us. From my perspective, the road towards articulating such a practice and position has only just begun. Mi Won Kwon pointed out in her book, One Place After Another, that the context-specific art emerging in the 1960s and onwards generated new roles and possibilities of critical inquiry for artists, such as socially engaged practice and collaborative processes, which were often also critiques of the institution of authorship. Sight, in many ways, <clears throat> replaced the author as the locus of authenticity. For me, working curatorially with a notion of context specificity has offered a way to think about what I do as embodied and situated without foregrounding the tropes of individual authorship and ownership. So the two projects I will talk about today, which both came out of physical encounters with specific sites, encounters that profoundly influenced both the discursive framing <clears throat> and physical staging of the resulting exhibitions, will not answer the question of the whereabouts of the body of the curator. But hopefully, they will give a partial account of how I arrived at asking that question. And I will start sharing my screen. In 2014, I was traveling in the northern region of Sweden, doing research for a series of projects dealing with the transition from industrial to post-industrial society that I had proposed to the public art agency Sweden. And it's the pink section that you see on this map, uh, Norrbotten, <clears throat> where I was traveling at the time. On my last day in the city of Luleå, I found myself on Data Street, Datavägen in Swedish, facing the gigantic server halls housing Facebook's European servers. It was a chilly evening and the sun was just about to set. I could hear the electricity sing as it traveled through the grid of high voltage pylons and into the building. The previous week had been spent touring some of the country's hydraulic power stations, so I knew exactly where the electricity was coming from. As you can see on this map, almost all of Sweden's major rivers have been used for this purpose, sometimes causing major alterations to the landscape. This, for example, is a dried up <clears throat> riverbed. The hydraulic power network was built during the first half of the 20th century in conjunction with the expanding mining industry. 
There are some examples. This is the ITIC copper mine in uh, Boliden and the Kiruna uh, iron mine. Standing on Data Street, listening to the sound of the infrastructure of the past, powering the social media industry of the present, I realized that the premise of my project would have to be changed. Contrary to how I had previously formulated it, as tracing a shift from the industrial to the post-industrial, this embodied encounter made it blatantly clear to me that this did not correspond to reality. Rather, society had moved into a stage of hyper-industrialization, expanding its processes of extraction and commodification from mining the Earth's resources to also include human social interaction and emotions. The encounter launched a new research strand for me, focusing on the comparison between the Earth and the body and the links between mineral, digital and emotional mining. I think Mark Zuckerberg's smile perfectly captures the core of this project. For companies like Facebook, the data that we, their many billion daily visitors, leave behind is just as valuable, if not more, as the hundreds of thousands of tons of iron and copper extracted from the mines in northern Sweden every day. The algorithms directing the contemporary flows of data through the server halls in Luleå play the same role as the application of explosives in the iron mines a few miles away. The connection between metal and data mining is not just metaphorical and linguistic, but intensely material. The metals extracted from the ground are essential for the production of the digital technology that is in turn extracting our data and social interaction. As the extractive regime expands from metal to data, grounds shift and rivers are redirected or dried up. But our social interaction and emotional landscapes are also changing. A few years ago, Facebook was called a digital form of climate change. Should human sociability and emotional life also be understood as limited, just like the Earth's resources? It's scientifically established that emotions are important to make humans productive. But with the societal change brought on by the first three ages of industrialization, we were giving less and less opportunity to cultivate our emotions in the traditional way, due, for example, to a lack of personal time and increased separation between age groups. Due to intensified working hours, we have less time to spend with our children, friends and elders. Often, we are also required to relocate geographically in search for work, distancing us from long-term friendships and social fabrics. From this perspective, the explosion of social media that we are now experiencing should not only be understood as profit-making entertainment, but as a way of producing emotions according to the industrial principles of standardization and predictability in order to maintain our productivity under anxiety-inducing work-life conditions. While I was researching this, I innocently typed the word emotion into a search engine. And this is uh, the result, as you see in the image. Should we be worried about this? If industrialization made mountains stop being mountains and rivers stop being rivers, will the fourth industrial revolution, where biological, technological and material spheres are merging in new ways, eventually stop humans from being human? Neuroscience tells us that the brain is not a fixed entity, but a plastic one. Like rivers and bedrock, it is physically modified in relation to what we interact with. 
it is scientifically proven that daily interaction with, certain, with a certain object or infrastructure, like a piano or a social media platform, will, re will rewire your brain to a certain extent. The way you produce thoughts and emotions will change, just like metal mining shapes the landscape and reroutes groundwater reserves. Oil and minerals were created during very specific historical circumstances. Once they have been depleted, there will be no more. Should we regard human emotions as we know them today in the same way? They too have developed during specific historical circumstances. Will they be depleted if they are extracted beyond exhaustion or changed beyond recognition through being standardized? This research led to a string of different exhibitions exploring industrialization and extractivism. When I returned to Lulio to stage the final exhibition in the series in 2017, I wanted to return to the feeling produced by my initial encounter there with the interconnected infrastructures of mining, data mining and power extraction. To do this, I decided to use infrastructure from the 1950s built at the peak of uh, Swedish uh, high industrial society as exhibition sites. Installing contemporary artworks, existing ones as well as new commissions, into these buildings, I wanted to create an embodied encounter with extractive logics and their historical continuation. In this curatorial model, the exhibition sites are as important as the artworks. The layer of meaning added by the exhibition and the curatorial framework is staged precisely through their juxtaposing. And let's look at some examples of this. Uh, so what you see here is the building built in 1953 uh, as a post office in the center of Lulio, uh, which in the last two decades, uh, due to the digital revolution, uh, became commissioned and uh, emptied. And it's now used as a kind of public space uh, with um, also a public program funded by uh, the university in Lulio and the mining industry. And in this uh, space, uh, we showed a work um, by uh, Yuri Pattison called Co-Location Time Displacement, which you see on the um, existing video screen there in the middle of the image. And uh, I guess what this produced, the idea here was to um, kind of overlay one infrastructure with another. So Yuri's um, video is uh, roaming the insides of a data center located inside a, a mountain uh, or uh, yeah, inside the ground, actually underneath uh, Stockholm. Um, and these images are accompanied by chat log from the very early days of the internet, reminding us of a time when the digital sphere was thought of as a space of freedom, quite different from uh, the intensely commodified space that it is today, dominated by a handful of companies. Another site we used for the exhibition was this uh, former military communications central, built at the same time as the post office, um, deep inside uh, the mountain of Mjölkudsberget. And here, um, the artist group Rax Media Collective uh, created a site-specific installation called the Blood of Stars. And this um, installation unfolded across uh, 10 different rooms inside this uh, old military location inviting us to think about the relation between the presence of iron as a residue from the formation of the universe, sleeping deep inside the earth and its course through the veins of warm blooded mammals, uh, including our own bodies. And it also registered the relationships between mining, militarism and the 
landscape of Norrbotten where the exhibition was located. The third main venue was this uh, public swimming pool, Pontusbadet, also built uh, around the same time in the 1950s. Uh, and you can actually see through the windows of this uh, swimming pool, the river, the Lula River, um, where some of the hydraulic power is extracted from. So the building of these public swimming pools was um, very important in Sweden in the years after the war, after the Second World War, uh, uh, in the kind of peak uh, industrial development. Uh, as you might be familiar, Sweden is quite a cold, uh, dark uh, place to be living most of the year. So this um, warm, illuminated uh, environments of, of swimming pools created almost like tropical zones um, within this more cold uh, landscape uh, across the country. And of course, uh, they were facilitated by the availability of um, abundant and quite cheap electricity coming from the rivers, from the hydraulic power extracted from the rivers. And in this site, we showed um, a new video work by Lisa Tan called My Pictures of You, where she is um, uh, co oops, conflating um, images of uh, the deserted landscape um, in Texas, where she grew up, the deserts in Texas, with images of Mars um, and uh, reflecting on uh, how the depletion of water and the Earth's resources uh, relates to our current human culture. But we also showed, let's see, oh, now it's not moving. No, oh, how strange. Okay, let's see what happened there. Uh, we also showed, um, uh, textiles by Eva Stina Sandling that uh, shows the life around the Lula River before the hydraulic power was installed there and before the river was transformed from um, being the natural life nerve of uh, life along it into this um, electrical power station. I will jump to the next project and discuss them together at the end. So the next project I will talk about is the forthcoming biannual in Göteborg, the ghost ship and the sea change opening later this year. This project also takes a specific site as its starting point, namely the plot of land in the Göteborg harbor, informally referred to as Franska Tomten, the French plot of land. While doing preparatory research for the biennial at the city museum, I came across a fact that I had never heard before. On a wall label connected to a display about the city's harbor, I read that this particular plot of land, encompassing no more than a few city streets, got its name in 1784 when it was exchanged for the Caribbean island of St. Bartholomew as part of a trade agreement between Sweden and France. While the French were giving free trade rights in Göteborg, Sweden took over the colonial administration of St. Bartholomew. This apparently symmetrical exchange hides a deeply asymmetrical power relation. Until 1847, Sweden's economic activities on the island were predominantly concerned with transatlantic slave trade. In 1878, after the abolition of slave, of slave trade, the territory was sold back to France. As the forthcoming biennial will coincide with the city of Gothenburg celebrating its 400 year anniversary, I was interested in looking at the relationship between the contemporary city and its historical past. With this in mind, I paid a visit to Franz Gatomten. Today, the capital of St. Bartholomew is still called Gustavia 
after the Swedish king Gustav III. But at Franska Tomten in Göteborg, there is no information or signs of commemoration to the shared history of these two places. The country's colonial involvement is not usually a part of how the story of modern Sweden is presently told. The legacy of the colonial trade, however, is most de definitely part of contemporary Sweden. Like many other European countries, Sweden profited immensely from taking advantage of goods and labor from across the Atlantic. This profit had not only to do with slave trade. A major economic factor was Sweden's export of iron to other colonial powers, used specifically to produce warships, weapons, shackles and chains. During the 17th and 18th centuries, Sweden was the biggest iron producer in the world. This export and expertise lay the foundations of the industrial society and welfare state we know today. But beyond the question of involvement of specific nation states, the European colonial project fueled the growth of the global capitalist system involving us all. Today, Franska Tomten is an anonymous piece of asphalted urban ground. But if we look closer, we see that this plot of land in fact tells the story of how the past 400 years continue into the present. The former headquarters of the transatlantic shipping company still occupies the site. A stone's throw away is the palatial building of another shipping magnate, Broström, that today houses the courts of justice for Western Sweden. Opposite this building, you find the old harbor warehouse, which today is occupied by a casino on one side and the museum house of emigrants on the other. And behind this building is the sea as infrastructure and biotope. These entities bear witness to a sequence of events spanning several centuries and geographies. Seen together, they form a fragmented map of the interrelated flows of goods, capital, bodies and ideology that have defined the last 400 years and continue to do so today. Yet nothing on this site publicly acknowledges the history and its global connections. If we zoom in further, however, we find a number of artworks that were commissioned by the transatlantic trading companies at the turn of the last century and still remain on site. So here we see um, a flagpole or the base of a flagpole. Here you get a closer look at some of the imagery on this flagpole. And on the side uh, of the building of the transatlantic trading company, <clears throat> you also have uh, reliefs, sculptural reliefs. This is inside the transatlantic trading company, one of uh, two wood carvings depicting um, the activities of the company. These sculptural reliefs, based on racist stereotyping, clearly express the colonial lineage and violent mindset of the trading companies. And how, even in the 1940s, when they were commissioned, this was seen as publicly acceptable and even a cause for celebration. The fact that these artworks are still there today, uncommented, says something about contemporary Sweden's tendency to ignore the country's long history and contemporary problems of structural racism. As these artworks appear to us today, placed in between the transatlantic building and the courts of justice, they also remind us of the role played by trade <clears throat> and international trade law in institutionalizing racism at the global level in order to preserve inequality 
and secure profits. <clears throat> the term white, for example, first appeared in colonial law in the late 1600s. <clears throat> Encountering this historically rich but conspicuously anonymous site, it was clear to me that it needed a public re-reading. As the only explicit traces of the site's past are artworks, it seemed logical to address it through the biennial and ask contemporary artists to respond to the consequences of this history today. What could it mean for the biennial to let its narrative start from this plot of land? How might that maneuver inform the curatorial method? In what way might using the material, historical and symbolic layers of this site as a narrative device alter our way of thinking about the history of the city? What could it make visible to us that the public institutions and history books currently do not? The first thing that felt significant was the double meaning of the English word plot used to describe both a piece of land as well as a narrative device. Poised in the middle between the idea of a site and the idea of a narrative, a plot is a sequence of events as well as a spatial designation. If a theme is an overriding message, the plot is rather how that message is played out through actions and events. To work curatorially with the idea of plot rather than theme seemed to me to offer a potentially different relationship to the authorship function. Rather than take an authorial position and stake out a definitive story or discourse, I could use the historical evidence already present on site as a narrative frame into which artists and artworks would be invited. In this model, each work and artistic position will offer a different perspective or reference to how we might understand the greater plot, i.e. the colonial capitalist matrix that this site is a product of and our current relationship to that. Rather than the curator imposing a master narrative, this model allows me to make inquiries together with the artists, each one of us performing actions from a different position and with different tools, generating a polyvocal form of narration that nevertheless hangs together through being part of the same plot. This form of narrating history from multiple perspectives situated in the present is quite different from how we might encounter historical narrative in a museum where there are expectations of coherence and progressive linearity. As a counter model to this convention of Western history and storytelling, the science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin has proposed a narrative structure that she calls the carrier bag theory of fiction. Le Guin uses the analogy of a carrier bag that can hold things of particular importance in no particular order. Thinking of a story and indeed an exhibition in that way leaves it open and unending without fixed outcomes and heroes or possible uh, and possible to tell in a multiple ways <clears throat> through multiple perspectives. Furthermore, it suspends the linear logic of past and present and allows for protagonists, both dead and alive, human and non-human, to shift their positions. In her book, In the Wake, on Blackness and Being, Christina Sharp questions the use of the term history when speaking of the slave trade. How is it possible to think of the transatlantic slave trade as being in the past when its consequences are still acting upon our present? 
Standing at Franska Tomten, I'm struck by how the buildings and artworks still present there show us that the past is not sealed off from the present, but continue in our midst. They are evidence of relations across time and geographies, telling us in the most concrete of ways that exploitative actions elsewhere have continuing effects right here. But the connections, these concrete traces of an otherwise absent history <clears throat> make us see, <clears throat> sorry, are also <clears throat> offset by the equally striking presence of the many gaps on site. The empty spaces between the buildings <clears throat> become a metaphor for how the links between them are rendered invisible and an image of the untold stories absent from the current historiography of the city. Just passing by the transatlantic trading company, <clears throat> the courts of justice, the casino and the house of emigrants on your way to work, you would not connect them to each other. But under the surface, they are not only deeply related, but evidence of a shared chain of events. The writing of law is historically bound up with relations and regulations of international trade. The global flows of goods and capital are connected to the flows of migration. And the slave labor of the past <clears throat> is not only continued today in different forms through exploitative labor practices, but has produced lasting effects such as institutionalized racism. The reason these links are not publicly visible is partly because they are forged using labor, land and materials located elsewhere and deliberately kept out of sight to the Northern European consumer citizen. It is also because these links are left out of how the story of the city of Göteborg is commonly told. We know about the global success of Volvo, but not about the colonial violence connected to the capital and infrastructure that made Volvo possible. In other words, at Franska Tomten, we can see that the casino and the house of emigrants are sharing a building, but nowhere in the public discourse of the city is the link between speculative capital and migration and how it shapes our lives clearly spelled out. In Venus in Two Acts, Saidia Hartmann writes that the irreparable violence of the slave trade lies precisely in the gaps left by all the stories we cannot know and never will. She also discusses how, when narrating the time of slavery in and as our present, we must avoid filling in the gaps and providing closure. Only by leaving the gaps open are we reminded or what is not and never will be there. <clears throat> but a gap is not only a lack. As every theorist of montage knows, it is also a space for action and additional meaning production. In the exhibition, it is in the gaps in between the works, the buildings, the sites, that the voice of the project can emerge. This voice is not possible to reduce to my curatorial framework or to each of the individual artworks. It is made up from the relations between them. These relations are infinitely more complex than the curatorial intention. They make up a field of interacting agencies of the works acting in those particular spaces, in those particular moments in time experienced in that geopolitical context with the particular bodies, knowledge and emotions of the visitors. This field of meaning is unstable and porous. It changes depending on who enters into it. While searching for a physical form to stage and house this web of interconnected but non-coherent histories, I read about another historical site that had fallen out of public view, a shipwreck 
left in the waters outside Gothenburg for centuries. Being the largest international port in Scandinavia for hundreds of years, the history of Göteborg is often told as a history of ships. In 1984, marine archaeologists found the shipwreck of the East India trader Göteborg that had sunk outside the city in 1745 after returning from one of its many trips to China. The find instantly became famous and eventually led to an exact and very expensive replica of the vessel being built and sailed along the same East Asian trading routes as the original ship with the purpose of promoting Swedish business in the region. And here's a rather bad image of the replica sailing into Shanghai, maybe, Biljana, you know, yes. <clears throat> when the ship is not sailing Southeast Asia, it is moored in Göteborg and functions as a museum. But not so well known, however, is that the same marine archaeologists also found another ship at the same time, the Danish West Indian trade vessel and slave ship Havmannen, that had been deployed in the triangular trade between Europe, Africa and the Caribbean before sinking outside Göteborg in 1683. Just as the Scandinavian involvement in the triangular trade remains largely suppressed when narrating the information of the Nordic welfare states, or the, not the information, but the formation of the Nordic welfare states, this ship was never dug up, publicly displayed or replicated. On the contrary, after it was found, it was buried under protective sheeting, pushed even deeper out of sight. Encountering the hidden ruin of Havmannen, I instantly knew that I had found a suitable vessel for the biennial. Together with the artists, the biennial will do what the city chose not to. We will dig, all by it discursively, until this ship comes back into view. Furthermore, the exhibition architects, Cooperative für Darstellungspolitik, have been commissioned to stage a metaphorical replica of this Scandinavian slave ship, still buried in the sands outside the city of Gothenburg. This ghost ship will be used as the exhibition architecture for the biennial, making itself felt across the multiple sites and venues of the project. The gesture mirrors the city's own attempt at connecting its past to its future through the East India trader Göteborg, but with one important difference. In our replica, the fragments will not be combined into a whole. On the contrary, there will be no attempt at closing the gaps and joining the dots into a comprehensible form. Presented as fragmented as the actual ship's ruin, the exhibition architecture will represent the incoherent and unknowable past that nevertheless frames our present. The walls produced by this ghost ship as exhibition architecture will for sure be uneasy ones. Their purpose is not to create the perfect conditions for the display of the artworks, but to be part of the telling of an uneasy story. <clears throat> in both of these projects, I set out to research broad historical phenomena. How the transition from high industrial to post-industrial society could be traced in Sweden. And how to relate the 400 year history of Göteborg from the perspective of today. What I've tried to speak about in this lecture is my process of searching for a specific entry point into these broad questions, to find a site where they reveal themselves and where I could enter the story, to situate my questions in places where I could speak from. In both projects, 
my research resulted in narrative frameworks that I hope could provide multiple entry points for the artists and the audience without reducing them to illustrators or consumers of a predetermined story. Through juxtaposing contemporary art with historically significant sites, both projects make visible how processes, events and materials not usually thought of together are in fact deeply interrelated and part of the same chain of events. Both projects were conceived as a way to understand and dig deeper into insights produced by on-site encounters. Starting from the specific material realities found at each site, the exhibitions use these as historical evidence, enabling us to trace larger societal developments from the point of view of a local context. By including artworks and artistic positions addressing other stories connected to other sites and events, the exhibition narrative is expanded into something reminiscent of a multi-sited archaeology, dealing with transnational economies, cross-cultural flows and diasporas that cannot be understood solely through single-site research. Staging these as a web of dislocated relations brought together by the frame of the exhibitions accentuate the contemporary condition that a place can only become legible through looking at other places. Both projects are also attempts at conflating the past with the present, showing how these are not separated layers of time, <clears throat> but deeply interconnected, affecting and leaking into each other in various ways, to the point where linear time begins to dissolve. In this way, the exhibitions can perhaps also be seen as testing grounds for a different form of historiographical narration than what conventional historical museums or her heritage sites provide. These projects have also been vehicles for thinking through my own position as a curator and narrator, pushing me to explore what it means to speak about and speak from. Perhaps I could even go as far as suggesting that they have functioned as translations of situated embodied experiences from the body of the curator to the bodies of the artists and the audiences. And that was it. If I can stop sharing. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, so please, if you have uh, questions, you can um, post them in the chat. And um, because we are recording, I will read. Uh, so take your time. Uh, but maybe, yes, I agree. And also for our Facebook viewers. Yeah. And yes, and for the Facebook viewers, it's, um, it's the same. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was very a little bit too dense, maybe to try to bring these two um, projects together. Um, but I wanted to kind of, it was interesting for me to look back a little bit at uh, my process from a few years ago and to understand how it had continued to inform what I'm working with uh, right now. But um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was listening to you um, uh, speaking, I couldn't really not to think about relating what you're talking about and histories, the way they're written in relation to what has been happening to us in the last year. Um, and maybe I will just start with a, with a question while we are waiting for people to, to type in. Um, that um, I often as a curator ask myself, and I don't have an answer to this question, but I'm still learning um, uh, about it um, myself, because at the beginning of the lecture, you, you said 
curating as a embodied situated practice and we basically start to talk about your travel through 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 the to the through the region um and uh, that body we don't have so we don't have it anymore you know mm -hmm. you mean now during the pandemic yes and mm -hmm. probably we won't have it throughout mm -hmm. this year as well um so i just wanted you maybe to a little bit reflect um how that shifted your working methodology on upcoming projects and really thinking um, about curatorial position within the current uh, new living condition. Yeah, uh, for sure it has affected me a lot because um, <clears throat> in the spring I, had, I was supposed to do research trips to meet artists in various parts uh, of the world and this was not possible to do so then you know you get stuck in front of the computer and you have to do your research that way and that's a very very different way of researching because i think what i was trying to illustrate when i started the talk with my encounter in lulio at the outside the facebook server was that i realized when i was actually there that the way I'd formulated that project at my desk at home before I set out on the journey needed to be re-articulated. And the same happens, of course, when you meet a specific local context, because then you realize that my way of, my perspective on the site that I'm working with now, Franska Tomten, um, and, and my way of asking questions to that is very different from somebody in the Caribbean, for example. Uh, but when I'm searching online, uh, I'm searching with my own questions predominantly, and I'm not getting, uh, um, how can you say, I'm not getting shaken or changed by the encounter with other contexts in the same way. So this is something I've been quite sad about and worried about for in many different uh, ways. Um, I also must say that, and I haven't really understood this myself, but I feel very, it's not that I love, you know, traveling all the time and all of this, but I do feel that I'm questioning my choice of working as a curator now, uh, since these past few months, because I feel that I, what I do now, just sitting in front of the computer, it's not what I was interested in doing. I wanted to meet other people and I wanted to think together with them through specific circumstances and specific materials and discover the world so, so to say and discover myself and other people in that way so there's something there that I feel very sad about and I'm now much more focusing on writing which is you know through through the computer and the computer as a site it feels more natural to me now so yeah so it's for sure creating some weird aspects and, and mm -hmm. we also don't know just to finish answer this question we also don't i mean we are planning to go ahead as normal with the biennial so we <clears throat> will open in june already and then kind of build up uh, opening the final sites in september and it all stays up until november but i mean we have no idea how this will unfold if the pandemic is getting more intense and uh, of course we need to think about how can we disseminate the project online but i think as you might have understood from my talk i'm really committed to physical uh, presentations and to generate physical experiences of of something so yeah that also doesn't feel so good <laughs> absolutely i think physicality is something that we really have to strongly uh, fight for yeah we have a number of questions uh, i'm going to start reading a uh, first question from adwa Ohusu baniek i apologize if i read his name wrongly where does the body of the curator find itself when the site spaces that would act as a plot are inaccessible Example in England, a lot of unexplored archive hide in the galleries and the heritage sites. 
yeah <laughs> good question <laughs> mm, i think that being uh, situated somehow you know it's not just about the physical location it to find your place of to speak from um might be a set of might be a discourse it might be a set of questions it might be your experience of the inaccessibility for example of these archives so i think uh, situatedness and context specificity should not be understood uh, only as limited to physical sites um yeah but it could be also other types of frameworks or experiences mm -hmm. that's what i would say in relationship to that question mm -hmm. julia wonder uh putin i would be interested into duration of time you spend with places as a curator yes this also varies uh, greatly depending on the project <clears throat> in the case of uh, lulio with the first project i traveled there uh, quite a few different times over the course of several years so i kept uh, coming back because uh, i was living in sweden at the time also uh, and with Gothenburg, uh, it's a place that I'm also very familiar with, as I have uh, not never lived there, but I've worked there and, and spent a lot of time there over the past 20 years, let's say. So, <clears throat> but of course, now since March, I have not been there uh, because I don't live in Sweden and the different rules and quarantines made it difficult to go. So when it comes to then staging, the final biennial here we're getting to a sort of crisis point for me i would say where i really need to go back to the various sites that we will use for the exhibition and uh, yeah i can only hope that this will be possible towards the end of this month or in february or so but i yeah but in general i um, would love for there always to be time more time and more possibilities to actually spend time because you always uh, see something else than what you do when you are not there. Mm. Uh, we have another question from Anne Zephyr Carlson. Thank you, Lisa, for the talk. Always a pleasure listening. Question is how might the artists you have worked with provide a different perspectives to the plot, as you say, based on their position and the bodies, I might add. Yeah, so uh, in relationship to the biennial that to, to Gothenburg, um, this is exactly, uh, I think, I mean, yeah, so what I realized, I mean, God, there's so many ways of answering this uh, question. It, the project is a biennial, but it's a very, very low budget situation, let's put it like that it doesn't live up to this expectation of you, that the word biennial brings where you think of a huge budget at least from a european point of view uh, we have a very small budget uh, and it's a very very small team uh, so we don't have the means the resources to invite international artists uh, to come to gothenburg uh, to make new works to commission new works we don't really i mean we can to a certain extent collaborate with uh, resident other residencies and uh, uh, other actors in in the city to allow for some time spent on site in addition to this the biennial and me uh, as part of it i am contractually bound by the bi biennial to exhibit predominantly international artists that's how their funding is basically um, framed so this means that um, i am bound to exhibit international artists but i don't have the money either to invite uh, <clears throat> international artists to excavate this local context or to even ship works 
uh, certainly not from outside Europe. So this limitation um, is quite frustrating, frustrating. But on the other hand, I then realized that it um, was actually it created quite an interesting situation, which uh, in my talk I describe as a kind of um, multi-sided uh, archaeology that to invite um, international artists who might never have been to Gothenburg to show uh, then often existing uh, works that are about other places and other histories uh, actually functions as a way to um, enrich our understanding of that of the local site of the Gothenburg site. So through these other, because we are somehow interconnected even though these uh, connections are not perhaps direct, uh, we are all part of this colonial capitalist matrix. Um, so actually adding these other perspectives that are, that are not under pressure to say something about the site in Gothenburg, but can only speak from the positions where they are located nevertheless makes us understand our own positions uh, in a different from a different perspective did that answer the question maybe thank you there is so many questions i have to probably apologize because i don't think we will have a time to go through all of them uh, but uh, uh, Ruth uh, Buchnan, thank you, Lisa. That was really great. Question was looping back to your initial comments about contingency and the relational. I wonder if you could comment on how you might in understand the relationship between exhibition making, history making, and liveness, both as a way to call a body forth, but also as a way to establish a, or deconstruct a temporal space. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for this question. And um, uh, thank you for your practice, Ruth, which I find uh, as an artist and exhibition maker, which I find uh, really inspiring. I should have said the same to Anne, maybe Sefa Carlson, who I also know. Yes, Ruth. Um, <laughs> mm, for sure, the relationship between exhibition making and history making is something that I I'm spending quite a lot of time thinking about at the moment and uh, that I was um, hinting at in my talk as well, like this kind of searching for a different way of um, um, narrating history through by using this open endedness of, of offered by the exhibition as a form. And I do think that uh, the aspect of liveness or like being alive um, is really uh, accentuated in a different way through contemporary art exhibitions dealing with history than museums dealing with history. Um, because it's very clear that contemporary art is made now from a a contemporary perspective um, and it's also clear that it is coming from subjective uh, positions so it uh, creates a really uh, interesting opportunity to explore how history is still alive uh, today in various ways um, we are all carrying inside our bodies, we are all carrying layers of past generations experiences and um, it's not so uh, visible to us maybe, but, but there are amazing artistic practices in the, in the previous biennial, for example, um, the artist Michel Dizon showed um, Two amazing works that precisely deal with this and her family's history of uh, the, the US colonization of the Philippines, for example. So um, I think, um, yeah, her work is an example of a practice that is staging and is making us experience uh, the living 
uh, traces of the colonial encounter that the museum display could not really uh, could not really do so mm. so yeah thank you for the question i think um, this is really something to keep on working with um, and maybe a last question, uh, just being mindful of time uh, from Guan Jie Huang, a fantastic presentation. Your practice, secretarial practice makes me think of video works of John Akonkrak. How do you manage to film the content of exhibition after huge, huge mind mapping? Do you always determine what you want to show after in situ investigation? Uh, I would say that um, I'm not, I mean, it's not a process of a huge mind map that is then filled in. <laughs> That's not how it works. It might seem, I understand that it might seem like that when I'm just sitting here talking <laughs> about myself, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, working like this it's a it's i would say that um what i was trying to describe is how i am first searching for a site where i can start to speak from and in this case it was the data street and then it was the Fra france catomte and the french plot of land uh, but then my thinking of course meets uh other people's uh, thinking um, both in my research through reading text etc but most importantly in the meeting with artists and uh, their practices so um, I definitely of course I, I am drawn I mean with the French plot of land it, I talked about it as a kind of fragmented map where you have these traces, this evidence of the flow of goods, you know, of international global trade, the slave trade, uh, the justice, and the relationship between trade and justice or trade and injustice and um, speculative capital and how that relates to migration, for example. So, of course, I begin then to look for artistic practices that are dealing with these topics somehow from their point of view. So in that sense, I guess, um i am filling in <laughs> the mind map but uh, always i would say these uh, specific encounters with other people and other practices develop and complexify <laughs> uh, the project hugely so my little mind map it's not so huge in fact it's quite basic and it needs to be very basic in fact the building blocks are, are are quite straightforward also because i am thinking about the audience i am thinking about creating some sort of tool a frame that will enable the audience to understand uh, then each artworks complexifies this mapping and adds so many more layers uh, so I really don't think about the works as filling in the map, rather it's um, making it come alive. Thank you, Lisa. I think that was a beautiful uh, sentence to end. Um, <laughs> and thank you all for um, joining in. Um, and uh, I apologize for not being able to um, answer all the questions but i hope uh, we will continue discussion through a different um, lectures um lisa i will see you tomorrow at the workshop and um for the participants of the program leave the questions for tomorrow um and i would like to invite all of you to a lecture on 12th that we have by Natasha Petreshin Bachelet on the practice of radical care. Uh, and by then, uh, please do practice uh, the care. Uh, stay safe and um, I will see you then uh, next week. Thank you, Lisa, one more time. Thank you.
Thank you, Biljana. Is it possible to somehow uh, keep these questions and comments so I could actually uh, answer people individually also if it makes... Uh, yes, definitely. I get him. Can we do that? Yeah, sure. I share the chat and we will send to you, Lisa. And That's what also, we you can, you, if you are using Facebook, you can go through with the comments. We have like a few questions there. Okay. And just Great. answer publicly. I will try to do Thank that. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.